And so today we're going to talk about faith in redemption and just kind of get you up to speed. You know, Naomi and Ruth have come back to Bethlehem. The, 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 uh, the famine is over and uh, uh, they are realizing that they're not in the best shape. They need somebody to help them out. When you were a widow back then, you didn't get social security from your husband there was no welfare. I mean, you were destitute, desolate, and you were in desperation. And so that's where Ruth and Naomi were. Although they were back in the house of bread, Bethlehem, they needed somebody to help them out. And so they, they know about this man. And as you recall, Ruth is gleaning on the field of this man named Boaz. And, and uh, he's helping her out, giving her extra food and, and protecting her. And there's this wonderful relationship that's blossoming. And Naomi is at the helm of this plan for them to be redeemed. And so she gives Ruth some instructions on what to do concerning Boaz, and we pick it up in the third chapter, the sixth verse, and it says this. So she went, so Ruth went down to the threshing floor and, and did just as her mother-in-law had commanded her. I like that. Uh, her mother-in-law commanded her, and Ruth has always been a very humble and also a very, very submitted individual, and so she listened. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went and lied down at the end of the heap of grain. They would, they would thresh the grain. And let me tell you something. They would lay down right by that because they didn't allow any marauders to come in and take their food. I mean, it was their income. It was their livelihood. And so he's laying there. And then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. And at midnight, the man was startled and turned over. And behold, a woman lay at his feet. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I think I would be too in pitch darkness in the middle of the night if there was a woman uh, laying at my feet. Now, I don't mind it now because Jan, she can lay at my feet all she wants, you know what I mean? <laughs> we don't do that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, we up in our separate little sides of our bed just, you know, <laughs> leave me alone. We trying to sleep through the night, if at all possible, <laughs> without waking up four times. How many of you relate to that? I will give you a help. Get a bed that has two separate sides to it that don't touch. You're close enough but far enough, and you'll live, all right? You'll be better. So <clears throat> he gets startled at this what's going on, and uh, he said, uh, who are you? <laughs> I, I would probably say the same thing. And she answered, she said, I'm Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant. And the wings there would, would mean, it could, you know, mean that the, the, his cloak, the end of his cloak, the wings of his cloak. Uh, you know, don't get all tied up on that, okay? It's a, it's a place of, perfect, of uh, protection. You can see it in Ezekiel 16. You can see it all over when it talks about wings. Basically, Ruth here, though, is she's moving in. She's actually kind of like proposing. She's putting herself out there. It's a, it's a place of faith for him to redeem her. And so she's saying, uh, uh, I want you to cover me up for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this kindness greater than the first in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich, which means that she was totally selfless. He's an older man, and he's saying, you could have young men. You probably, you, you know, she probably looked pretty good. You, you could have young men, but you came after me, an older man. It's kindness. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask. For all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. She had a great reputation already. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. So when we talk about a redeemer, and, and, and really what this is is a, what we call a kinsman redeemer, and we need to know what, what this is about because in the Jewish law, when a woman's husband died, a kinsman redeemer, someone near kin to them, had the responsibility to cover them, to marry them, and to redeem them, and even to have children with that woman, with, say, the brother's wife, his sister-in-law, in order to carry on the lineage of that man. Now, that's strange to us. I mean, you say, like, wow, I don't, I, you know, if my brother died, I definitely don't want to have anything to do whatsoever with my sister-in-law. <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about? I mean, just, some of you know what I'm talking about, probably, but, but that, you know... <laughs> 
The Israelites were different people than us, and that culture was different, and the law was different, and so he knew what was going on. So the kinsman redeemer had the privilege or he had the responsibility to act on behalf of that relative and to actually redeem them or rescue them, to cover them. I love the idea that God takes care of people. So there was a requirement for this kinsman redeemer. There's like three major things that had to take place. First of all, he had to be near kin. It just couldn't be any dude off the street say, yeah, I'll take her and I'll cover you. No, near kin. And then the second thing is that he had to have the means to do it. He had to be able to redeem her. And Boaz was able because he had money, he had land, so he could cover the expenses of that. And then he must be willing to redeem. He had to be willing And Boaz was more than willing, as we just read. He's ready there. But there was an obstacle in the the way of this redemption, and that was another redeemer. In other words, Boaz might have been like first cousin, but then there was this guy might have been the brother-in-law. He was first in line. And so Boaz seeks him out, and he speaks to him in the city gate. Now, one thing about the book of Ruth and Bethlehem, it evidently was a smaller community. You'll see some indications of that. And so Boaz is right there at the city gate, and the elders are there. There's witnesses there. And here comes this kinsman redeemer. And so he engages him, and he says, you know what? I I was wondering if you wanted to go ahead and take care of Naomi. You can redeem the land. You get Naomi. And he's very excited about it. He said, I think I could do that. That sounds good. Naomi, the land, sounds like a good deal. But then Boaz says, oh, by the way, you also have to take Ruth the Moabite. And all of a sudden, the guy's countenance changing. You can just, you just see him, and he starts figuring it out. He said, well, I don't know about this. I don't know about that. And anyway, it would be a great expense if I took this woman, Ruth, and I'm not sure that I can do that. It's going to mess with my economy. It's going to mess with my finances. So I don't want to do it. And so Boaz says, well, that's cool. That's all right. I will do it. And so they strike a deal, and a a funny thing takes place. You know, today we sign a contract or an agreement, but back then it was a lot more simple. A guy just took off his sandal and gave it to Boaz. (laughs) Wouldn't it be great if you went to buy your house? Wouldn't it be uh, rather than signing away your life or a cell phone, by the way? You know, it's about the same amount of documents. Well, you just took off your shoe and gave it to the guy at the counter and said, give me my phone or give me my house. And that's exactly what they did. They struck a deal, and it, uh, it, it took place. So it, in the book of Ruth, 4th chapter, 13th verse says, So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And the Lord blesses them with a child. In other words, Ruth is his wife. They have a baby together. Now look at the 14th verse. Then the, the women said to Naomi. Now this is amazing because the women are doing a lot of talking in this book. All right? Which is good. Hey, chill. It's good. Sorry, I was born a male. I don't know what to do about it. I'm not going to do anything about it, by the way. (laughs) Nothing. I ain't into that stuff. How about you? You shouldn't be going to keep going here. (laughs) Then the women said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, And may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. For your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. You see, there's a great significance to this baby. A wonderful significance. Because the Lord blesses Ruth and Naomi through, through, through her redeemer, through Boaz. And he, Boaz, and this child, he is going to bless us through a redeemer. So watch this in the 17th verse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name. I mean, the women got together and named this guy. I mean, it's just a strange little community to us. And a son had been born to Naomi, although Ruth is the one who gave birth to the baby. And they named him Obed, which means worshiper. And he was the father of Jesse, which means the Lord exists. And then Jesse is the father of David, or beloved of God, and that is King David. They say, well, what's the significance of that? Yeah, King David. So watch this. There's another redeemer coming. There's something. See, God always has a greater plan than what you see. And that's our, our problem. We only see in the, in the now, in the now, in the immediate right in front of us while God is working this elaborate plan 
And so watch this. There's another redeemer born in Matthew chapter 1. It's not on the board. Just let, let me read it to you. And Salmon, the father of Boaz, by Rahab, by Rahab, the prostitute that was rescued from the city of Jericho when Joshua took it. All the walls fell down. Remember, she had helped the spies, the spies that had come in to, to spy the land. And Rahab is found right here. Oh, my goodness. Uh, father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And then we go a little bit further down in the genealogy. And then Eliud, the father of Eleazar, and Eleazar the father of Mathan, and Mathan the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called Christ. Yeah, you ought to just clap or say something to see that God's got this wonderful, elaborate plan of redemption. Because Boaz, he's a great guy. Look, I'm glad you did that, Boaz, but I'm more glad that you started something that ended with Jesus, the anointed one called the Christ. And this redeemer, he wouldn't just redeem one family. He would make it possible for every person to be completely redeemed or completely Bought back. That's what redeem means. You know, when times were tough and you, you went to the pawn shop and you got your Makita drill and you got that $12 for it and you went and bought some meat for the week, you know, back in the day. And then when, when you got your paycheck, you went back to the pawn shop and what did you do about that drill? You paid your money. And what does that mean? You redeemed back what was yours. And that's what Jesus has done for us. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. He's the one. And like, like Ruth came to Boaz's feet and she laid down under his covering, under his authority, submitted and humble, we are to come. And this is the only way, folks, listen to me. The only way to come to God is humbly submitted to the lordship of Jesus Christ and coming to the feet of the cross and just laying yourself down in complete, 100% surrender. And there is no other way. There's absolutely no other way. And I know people are trying to sneak around the corner and do all kinds of things and, you know, water it down and do that. But you've got to come to the cross for redemption so the kinsman redeemer can handle things. I love Psalm 91 verse 1 says, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty, and I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. And then it continues, For he will deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his pinions, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness is a shield and a buckler. Under the wing, it's all through Scripture where we come underneath the wings of Jesus. Even Jesus uh, in the Gospels, when he looks at Jerusalem, he begins to weep over Jerusalem. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how many times, how often have I wanted to take you under my wings as a mother hen takes her chicks, but you would not. The you would not applies to so many people today. Here is Jesus still calling people. Even in this room right now, even right now, in chairs right now, Jesus is dealing and calling and wanting us to be submitted under the protection and the authority of his wings. And yet some people say, not now. No, I would not. It's a tragedy. Jesus. So let's go back to this kinsman redeemer for just a moment. Let's Let's back up. The requirements of that. He, he had to be next of kin. Boaz was. He was in Elimelech's family. And Jesus is the firstborn among many brothers. He's in the family of God. He had to be able to redeem. Boaz had money at land, and Jesus had one thing. Pure, spotless, precious, holy Blood. It's strange to some about the blood. Some people don't want to talk about the blood. But the blood is the only thing that God requires for redemption. Nothing else gets you in right standing with God except pure, 
precious shed blood of Jesus. And I know that's hard to understand, you know, with your mind. So don't go there about just blood, you know, the red blood. It's what it represented, purity and holiness. And then he must be willing to redeem it. And Boaz was. He had been watching Ruth. He said, I'm willing. And you know what? Jesus has been watching, and he is more than willing to to save to the uttermost people who call upon the name of Jesus. He's willing He even said it in the garden. He said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. I don't want to do this thing, but I'll do it because it's your will. The thing about the the book of Ruth that's so powerful, and it applies to us, is that Ruth was a Moabite woman. She was a pagan woman. So was Rahab, the prostitute. So was the Syrophoenician woman who had a demon-possessed daughter who who was at the the table of Jesus and and made recommendation that he would do something with her daughter. And and there's, there's all sorts of people. The woman at the well. There's so many people who are outside of the covenant of God who were not necessarily Israelites, but somehow or another God has called them in. And I know that, the, the man, it's like, wait a minute, wait a minute. They're not a covenant people. I, I know, but he's a covenant God. And, and there's something about being on the outside looking in to be redeemed. There's some of you who, who you just can't get it about being redeemed. Redeemed. Some of you feeling like his promise just can't be for you. You feel like maybe you're a Ruth, like unredeemable. You know, I know some of you. I know some of you right where you are because I, I have been there. You know, years ago, my brother, my older brother, told me a story about one of his friends. And uh, his name was Charles Painter. And uh, him and his brother, they beat up everybody in our city. I mean, everybody in school, they beat every, every fight they ever fought. They, beat, they were just, they were rough, mean, mean guys. And uh, my brother was in National Guard with Charles. And one day Charles uh, told him a story. He said, you know, of course, we are all Catholic in South Louisiana. Everybody's been Catholic at least once. And we were, we were all Catholics. And, you know, and so we go to confession. And Charles decided he would go to confession. <laughs> so he went to confession and he told the priest all what he had done. All of his sins. Now, here's the story. Hey, don't get theological on me. Don't, we, this is, this, this, hey, chill. This is what Charles said. I'm just saying what Charles said. He told my brother, he said, I, I, I told the priest all what I had done. And the priest said, well, uh, brother, I, I'm sorry, but I cannot give you absolution. You have sinned too much. <laughs> okay? I didn't make this up. This is true. I mean, so, so my brother told me that story about Charles' sin was so bad that the priest wouldn't forgive him. So I want you to fast forward about 15 years. I don't know, a long time, okay? A Tuesday night in April 1980, Jan and I are in our living room and some people are leading us to Jesus. And let me tell you something. When, 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 when Daryl, who led us to the Lord, when he said, are you ready to ask Jesus to forgive you of your sin? In an instant, I mean like, like Charles Painter. I mean, it's like the devil just brought that up. Just pow, Charles Painter. If the priest wouldn't forgive Charles Painter for what he did, there's no way that Jesus is going to forgive you for what you have done. You see, because I knew what I had done. And so do you. You know everything about you. But further than that, God knows even things that you don't know about yourself. And I remember <clears throat> such a warfare Just trying to, before I made the step to ask forgiveness, is Jesus going to forgive me? Really and truly now I realize, can I trust Jesus to redeem me? Is it possible? And some of you are sitting in here right now and you're saying, is it possible for Jesus to redeem me? And I would say Jesus redeems every part of our life. Every part of our life he does. He redeems our past. It's really possible for Jesus to forgive our past. I I was just wondering, what is your Moab? Where did you go when things were tough? What's your big mistake? What's your big sin? What do do you need to be restored in? Where is your redemption need to land? I mean, you know, did you steal? Was it adultery? I mean, was it an abortion? Did you murder somebody? Have you lied? Have Have you hurt somebody's reputation? 
Have you been unfaithful to your wife or your husband? I mean, what is it? Have you stolen on the job? Do you have something in your possession right now that's not your? What is your moy? Where is your sin? Even in the past 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago, because it plagues you. There are people who are living in torment right now in the church, in the chairs, with their past heavy on them and never had the revelation that Jesus will redeem your past. He will even take your problems, he will take your sin, and he will turn it around for good. It's impossible with men, but you know what? There's nothing impossible with our God, and that's the wonderful thing about it. Jesus restores our past. Naomi was a Jew. She was no stranger to the promises of God, and she goes to, she goes to Moab, and we could blame her husband, but she was up in there too, and they go to Moab, man. They should have just hunkered down in God. See, we need to hunker down in Jesus when times get tough and not break and run. What's your big sin? Where is it? Maybe it's bitterness, unforgiveness. Oh, it could be. I mean, the list is like this long. Not only the past, and I'm thankful for him redeeming the past, but Jesus can also redeem our present. And this is a big deal. Does Jesus really care about my life now? Does he care about the depression the discouragement? Does he care about the, the, the defeats that we, we, are, we, are, we are going through? I mean, d- does he really care what you're going through right now, your present life? Yes, he does. Can he redeem what is going on in your life right now, what you've lost? Can he redeem that? Can he turn what, was, what, is, what is ugly and wrong and bad, sinful or defeat, even by the enemy, Can Jesus redeem that and turn it around? The answer is absolutely yes, he can. I love 2 Corinthians 1.22, talking about this present life. And who also put his, Jesus, put his seal on us and has given us his spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. The stamp of the, the seal of the Holy Spirit on the believer's life is a guarantee for the future. In other words, the future is taken care of in the present. It's so wonderful to know. Let me tell you something. You can't have any hope in the future unless you've got the seal of the Holy Spirit in the present. You've got got to have him. He's got to be living on the inside of you. Come on now. He's your connection. He's God on the inside of you, and that's the hope. That's the hope of glory. That's the guarantee. The guarantee is the lens to the future. And there's so many people who don't have this by revelation, understanding the presence of God, the, the, now, the nowness of, of God in a believer's life, constantly drawing us to eternity. I tell you right now, lift up your heads. Come on now. Your redemption draws near. You say, is Jesus coming back tomorrow? Uh, it, it doesn't matter whether he comes or he calls you. It's all the same. Whether it's a, a month, a year, or 500 years, it's all the same. It's the Holy Spirit that seals our present time. Look, Jesus knows the depression I've been through. Jesus knows the trial I've been through. Jesus is walking with me and you through everything that you're going on. Let's stop saying, why are you allowing this? And say, Jesus, thank you for warring with me. Thank you for walking with me. Thank you for encouraging me in my discouragement. Come on. Thank you for giving me the victory when defeat seems imminent. Jesus redeems our present. And hallelujah, Jesus redeems our future. Oh, I love that. Can I rest assured that Jesus will have my future? Can I rest assured there to be positive that Jesus has sealed my future? Because it is. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, so hey, you might suffer a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Does that sound like full redemption? 
He's going to confirm you, restore you, strengthen you, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Eternal inheritance, the end result, the truth of being fully redeemed. The thing about it is, is that you can't wait to experience the future in the future. You have to, through the eye of faith, through the trust of the, of the Spirit of God in your life, you have to embrace the future. I have no idea what my future is going to be in this world, but I am assured that my future is sealed until the day of full redemption. And that makes a big difference in your life. The only way to overcome the fear of death is to have the seal of the Spirit and know that your future is sealed by God. Jesus, our Redeemer, paid the price for you. Not, not for Pastor Van only, not, not for this preacher or that singer or the one here, the one there, not for just that leader, but for every one of you. Understand, this is the way I like to look at it. Years ago, I just, I didn't have a vision. I just, it's an illustration. Redemption, I, I, I could see in heaven <laughs> like little shelves, little wooden shelves, just endless shelves with little mason jars with people's names on the outside of every jar. Just seek just for miles and miles. And there they were, full of redemption, full of salvation, just sitting there waiting for that person to find their jar and just take it. You see, you have to just take it. You have to take him at his word, and you have to take your redemption. You can sit and let it sit on the shelf preserved for you. But until you take it, it never becomes real in your life. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. You were bought with a price. What was the price? Acts chapter 20 says it, that the church was bought with the blood of of God. That's what has bought us. Not money, not possessions, not prestige, but by pure blood. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It's glorious. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. The book of Ruth is a great explanation of the gospel. You see, the gospel is the answer to your sorrows. The gospel is the answer to your desperation. And the gospel is the answer to your redemption. It is the answer to everything. The gospel is absolutely the only hope of redemption for mankind. There is no government. There is no economy. There is no business. There is no military. There's no financial planning. There's no, no more humanistic foolishness. It's the good news of the kinsman redeemer, and his name is Jesus Christ. And at the name of Jesus Christ, every tongue will confess, every knee will bow, that Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's what it's all about. I tell you, throw everything to the east and to the west, but embrace the glorious gospel of Christ because by it is the only way that you will ever be redeemed in Jesus' name. <laughs>